Allow me to, since my brother has prayed against, allow me just to say this and to position the sermon this way. That brokenness is a malady afflicting our society today. When I say that something is broken, what I mean by that is that it is not working as it should. When a car is not working as it should, it is broken. When an airplane is not working as it should, it is broken. When a marriage does not work as it should, it is broken. When a relationship fails to work as it should, it is broken. When a society doesn't work as it should, it is broken. When a political system doesn't work as it should, as promulgated by the Constitution, it is broken. When your health doesn't work as it should, it is broken. And brokenness is afflicting us at alarming levels, it is almost a pandemic. We are living in a broken society, governed by broken leaders, having jurisdiction over a broken populace. The brokenness is so severe, you just need to look at what happened at Quarry the other day where several decapitated bodies and mutilated bodies were found near a pipeline as I understand it. Just yesterday, the former president of the United States, Donald J. Trump, escaped assassination, an assassination attempt with a bullet whizzing right past his ear and there was blood on his face and he had to be whisked out of the podium as he was doing his political campaign. The world we live in right now, the globe, has 56 wars and conflicts raging across this globe. And 92 countries involved in them, some of them having internal conflict by, the, by civil war and others having international conflict where nation is rising against nation and kingdom is rising against kingdom. I believe it's the famed philosopher C.S. Lewis, the Oxford Don, that put it this way. He said, God whispers to us in our conscience. He speaks to us in our pleasures, but he shouts to us in our pain. One thing that brokenness does to us is that it brings us to a point where God makes us aware that we cannot fix our own problems unless he is fundamentally in the picture. And that is why you look at the passage this morning, Isaiah 11. It is coming in the midst of one instance of brokenness after another. You read Isaiah chapter 1, it talks about brokenness of some kind. You go to Isaiah chapter 2, it's talking about brokenness of some kind. Go to Isaiah 3, Isaiah 4, Isaiah 5, it talks about brokenness of some kind. And Isaiah 6, Isaiah 7 is when you begin to realize that the Messiah is being introduced as Emmanuel. And then you go back to chapter 8. It revisits this idea of brokenness in chapter 9 where you are told that this child unto us, a child has been born unto us, a son has been, been given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. He shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You are being told that the government shall be upon his shoulders. Then 10 visits the notion of brokenness and you come to 11. You see the following words, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit and the uh, spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel 
and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of all the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt. Faithfulness, the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young ones will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like an ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra. And the young child will put his hand in the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. You look at that passage and it is telling you that Jesus is coming to fix our brokenness. Jesus will fix our brokenness by doing three specific things. The first one is this. Jesus will fix our brokenness by healing our minds. By healing our minds. Look at verse 1 and 2 and even 3. It says, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. Old Testament scholars will tell you that this juice, uh, this, this, this shoot that will come up from the stump of Jesse is really Jesus Christ. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. And listen to this. The spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. Reminiscent of the time that Jesus was walking into the river Jordan. And here is John the Baptist getting ready to baptize him. And the, the heavens open and the spirit of the Lord descends upon him in the form of a dove. The spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. Listen to these mental qualities. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and of power. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. This idea of wisdom is a mental quality. Understanding is a mental quality. Counsel is a mental quality. Power is a mental quality. Knowledge is a mental quality. And of course, the fear of the Lord is also a mental quality because it's fundamentally emotional. All these qualities are mental and Jesus is bringing them to us so that you and I can benefit from the healing of our minds. That's why Romans 12 2 says, do not be conformed any longer to these patterns of this world, but be, re be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. There's a certain renewal that comes with Jesus Christ upon you and upon me so as to ensure that our entire bodies, our entire beings are set right. You do know that the battle for the human person is usually fought in the mind. There's a battle between God on the one hand and the devil on the other. And it's usually the mind that is the target. When Christ fights for you, he comes to your mind. The intellect has got to be, in a certain sense, engaged. When that happens, we are told that your mind is the battleground between God on the one hand and Satan on the other. The state of the mind is at stake. In the political system of the United States, we are told that there are certain battleground states which any candidate that runs for president, if he carries any of those states, he is sure to win the presidency. But here is what is called the battle of the mind. And whoever wins the mind, whether it is God or Satan, will win your heart. It begins with the mind. That's where it all begins. When I was a pastor at AIC Jericho, I believe it was 94 and 95, and a little bit of 96, I was a youth pastor, 
And these young folk would come to me and tell me, Pastor, we know you're a pastor, but clearly you're not an angel. You're a human being. You wrestle with thoughts, we imagine. When you wrestle with thoughts, do evil thoughts ever come to your mind? And I said, yes, they do. And they were all shocked. They were like, oh, evil thoughts come to your mind? I said, yes, they do. Well, how do you deal with them, they asked. I said, well... And I gave them an answer that was given by a certain theologian in 14, 1545, 1500s. He said this. When he was asked the same question, he said, he was asked, do you ever deal with evil thoughts? He said, yeah. How do you deal with them? He said, I deal with them the way I deal with birds that fly in the air. Well, how? I cannot keep those birds from flying in the air, but I can keep them from building a nest on my head. You cannot keep evil thoughts from coming into your mind. They will come, but you can keep them from building a nest in your mind, taking residence there. You only need three seconds to look at a terrible picture on the screen of your gadget. You only need three seconds to be taken captive by it. And the only person I know that has the power to deliver that mind is Jesus. Amen. The only person I know that can change your mind so that you can think of noble things as mentioned in the book of Philippians. Whatever is good and noble, think on these things. The only person capable of doing that is Jesus Christ. Because psychologists do lose their mind as well. Psychiatrists do lose their minds. Pastors do lose their mind. But only Jesus will keep your mind stable. And Jesus will fix our brokenness by healing our minds. Oh, there's a second one. Jesus will fix our brokenness. Not only by healing our minds, but also by healing our morals. You begin with the mind. To heal the morals, you better begin with the mind. But once he has healed the mind, he goes now to the morals. We are told he will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of all the earth. And then he continues to say, he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. And then listen to this. Righteousness will be his belt. Faithfulness, the sash around his waist. You have three components of morality. Righteousness being mentioned. Justice being mentioned. Faithfulness being mentioned. Being reminded here that he will not only judge with righteousness, he will be righteousness personified. He will not only bring justice, he will be justice personified. He will not only show some faithfulness in his leadership, he will be faithfulness personified. Righteousness with a capital R, justice with a capital J, faithfulness with a capital F, showing you that this person is the actual personification of morality. So that when he sits on the throne in the city of David, you will never be mistaken about who the ruler of the world will be. There will never be a miscarriage of justice. Righteousness will be his belt. Faithfulness, the sash around his waist, is coming hot on the heels of a situation that took place in the kingdom of Israel, probably several decades, maybe 30, maybe 40, maybe 50 decades that had gone by. Isaiah himself was preaching in Judah, and he was preaching during the time of King Uzziah and King Hezekiah. As he preached those days, he was telling them, whatever might have happened in Israel, and whatever might have happened in Judah, we are looking forward to a time when these things will be a thing of the past. Bear in mind that there was a lot of street demonstrations those days. There was a lot of demonstrations and fightings. In fact, the entire nation of Israel was taken captive by Assyria and the entire nation of Judah was taken captive by Babylon. So they were going through tumultuous times and Isaiah was telling them, I have good news for you. 
Righteousness will judge us. Justice will judge us. And faithfulness will judge us. And it will come in the person of Christ. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. And from his roots a branch will bear fruit. So here you have King Ahab. That basically went to a certain gentleman called Naboth. And tells Naboth, I want your vineyard for my purposes. Naboth says, no, I cannot give you this vineyard. It is an ancestral piece of land. You cannot grab it from me. So Ahab goes to his bedroom pouting. And his wife Jezebel comes to him and says, why is the king so sad? And he says, I went to Naboth. I asked him for, to give me his vineyard for a small exchange. I'll give him some fee, but he refused. Queen Jezebel says, are you not the king of Israel or not? I am going to give you Naboth's vineyard by this time tomorrow. So she gets two people to testify against Naboth. Saying that we heard that this man cursed God. Remember that the, the one person who did not care much about God was Jezebel. She worshipped Baal. And she said, I will get these people to falsely testify against Naboth, bearing false witness, breaking one of the commandments. And that's exactly what happened. And Naboth was stoned to death, and she grabs the land and gives it to Ahab, say, Ahab saying, this is your vineyard. You know what happened at that point was, she took the good and adulterated it and made it evil. And she took evil and basically glorified it and made it look like good. That's what she did. So that Naboth, an innocent man, was declared, was accused of blasphemy. And she, an evil woman, presented herself as a person who was a custodian of God's laws. Frederick Nietzsche, the German philosopher, said this. He asked the question in his book, The Transvaluation of Values and the Genealogy of Morality. He says this. What if what we call good is really evil and what we call evil is really good? He began with that hypothesis and traced it back all the way to the history of the early philosophers such as Aristotle and Plato, specifically Aristotle, and he said, you know what, that's exactly how it was. What we call good today in the Bible was really evil, and what we call evil in the Bible was really good. After he made that claim, he said, we need a superman to take us back to those values. A superman to basically remove and strip uh, the society of its understanding of morality as understood by the Bible, take it back to what it used to be, so that we'll go to our original conception of the good and the evil. And he said the person to do that, listen to this, this is absolutely fascinating, the person to do that is the Antichrist. That's what he said. After making that claim, not too long after that, he had a nervous breakdown. Nietzsche was the son of a pastor, and he made that claim. Brothers and sisters, good and evil are like the negative and positive poles of an electric current. Good and evil are like the negative and positive poles of an electric current. So says one thinker. And he says, good and evil are like the negative and positive poles of an electric current. But in our imagination, we have made the good to look ugly and the evil to look full of charm. They are like the negative and positive poles of an electric current. If you transpose the two, darkness will fall. That's why we are in moral darkness today. We have made the good look evil and the evil to look good. Bribery is acceptable. 
It is a good thing to bribe. That is our society. It's a good thing to be tribalistic. That is our society. It is a good thing to get all you want and greed. But a time is coming. We are told when the Lord Jesus Christ will bring in what has been called in our ordinary contemporary Swahili, moral ukarabati. That is what Jesus is coming to do, to transform our morals and to make us know what exactly good is and what evil truly is. And to tell us that he will judge the world with righteousness, with justice, and with faithfulness. When I was in St. Patrick's Eten as a student, the teachers there would stand in front of us and they would tell us smoking and drinking are a no-no. You cannot smoke and drink in this school. It's against the rules to drink, against the rules to smoke. Anybody found drinking and smoking will not only be severely punished, but will be suspended for two weeks with possible expulsion. There was only one problem. Those teachers were chain smokers and celebrated alcoholics. <laughs> How do you preach against something when you yourself have not applied it to yourself? You lose your moral authority to do that. But Jesus will be righteousness personified. He will be faithfulness personified. And he will be justice personified. It begins with the mind. Once the mind has been transformed, it goes now to the morals. But now, Jesus will heal our brokenness by healing our morals. First of all, he'll fix our brokenness by healing our minds. Secondly, he will fix our brokenness by healing our morals. There's a third one. And it is this. He will fix our brokenness by healing our motherland. Are you with me? He will fix our brokenness by healing our motherland. Notice how the motherland in this book is being articulated and crystallized. Listen to this. He says, the wolf will live with the lamb. Wolves don't live with lambs. Wolves eat lambs. The leopard will lie down with the goat. Leopards don't lie down with goats. They have never been bedfellows. Leopards eat goats. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together. And a little child shall lead them all. You talk of Gen Z leading them all. A little child shall lead them all. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young ones will lie down together, the Bible says. And the lion will eat straw like an ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra. The young child will put his hand in the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea, the motherland will be healed. Amen. The earth will be healed, and that includes Kenya, I believe so. The motherland will be healed. Irrespective of the consternation, irrespective of the trepidation, is irrespective of the situation, those who trust in Jesus, will see the healing of the motherland. And by the way, let me say this. It was not in my notes at all. Let me say this. You don't begin by healing the motherland first so as to heal the morals and then heal the mind. You are going the opposite route. You don't, healing of the motherland is a symptom of a bigger problem. You have to begin with the mind first. 
Once the mind has been healed, you can be sure that the morals will be in place. And once the morals have been healed, then you can be sure that the inhabitants of the motherland will live morally upright lives and that will bring healing. And only Jesus is big enough to do that. I have bad news for you. No pastor will heal you. No politician will heal you. No policeman will heal you. No senator will heal this motherland. No member of parliament will heal this motherland. The only person that can heal this motherland is Jesus Christ. And when we go to him and tell him, heal our land, he has made that promise. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn away from their wickedness, then I will hear from heaven, heal their land, forgive their sin. I will listen to the prayers offered in this place. I'm not telling you not to go out and demonstrate. I'm not telling you that. I'm not even telling you to stay in the house and not go demonstrate. All I'm telling you here is, we have a solution. And it is Jesus. He has given it in his theoretically written word. Several years back in 2008, when this nation was rocked by ethnic conflict after the disputed presidential elections, I I'm sure you remember that time. Those of you who uh, were born before then, I'm sure you remember that. 1,500 lives were lost. And I remember one pastor telling me what he did during that time because it was a difficult time for pastors. And he, he may actually have done it here. I don't remember. I might be mistaken about that. He said, listen, our country is broken. It's falling apart. And we, our tribes are fighting against each other. I don't want the ethnic animosity afflicting our nation to spill over into this building. Today is Communion Sunday, and I want to be the object of, I want to be an agent of the healing that Christ brings. If you are, I'm supposed to serve you Holy Communion. I will not do that today, he said. You serve one another Communion. Go and pick up somebody from a different tribe. Come to the altar. Serve one another from Communion. If you are from Western, pick somebody from Eastern. Come to the altar. Serve one another Communion. If you are from Central, pick somebody from Nyanza. Come to the altar. Serve one another Communion. And I'm told that there was not a dry eye in the room because they were asking themselves, why are we butchering one another? Why are we killing one another? Why are we hating one another? Why are we bringing animosity against each other? He, they were asking themselves that question. You were asking yourselves that question if you were here when that was happening. Why? Because when Jesus was crucified on the cross, whose communion we are celebrating today, when Jesus was crucified on the cross, he was in essence saying, I was butchered so you don't have to butcher one another. I was pierced so you don't have to pierce one another. I was insulted so you don't have to insult one another. I was spat on so you don't have to spit on each other. I was hated so you don't have to hate each other. And the Bible says, after Jesus had said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. It was torn in two from top to bottom. Now there are many interpretations, many ways of looking at that. The book of Hebrews gives us a suggestion that the curtain was removed so that the veil after being removed, you and I can have access to the Holy of Holies through the death of Christ. I am absolutely convinced that is correct. But there is a certain interpretation that lends itself. The meaning of the tearing of the curtain in two from top to bottom. The curtain of the temple was the only cloth at that time associated with God because it was basically a garment that was as thick as my hand and it was housing the Lord's temple separating the holy from the holy of holies. And when the curtain of the temple was torn in two, it was God taking his hands and ripping the temple apart, expressing his grit. In fact, when Jacob was told that his son Joseph had been killed and mauled by wild animals, 
He tore his robe in grief because his son had died. When Job received word that his children had been killed in the natural catastrophe brought about by the devil, Job tore his robe in grief. When Jephthah was running back to his home after a successful military campaign, he had prayed, God, whatever I meet with first, I will give that to you. Who does he behold but his daughter coming to him with tambourines, thanking God and praising God for the victory. And Jephthah tore his robe in grief. When Caiaphas the high priest interrogated Jesus, and asked him, are you the son of God? And Jesus said, yes, you have said so. And you will soon see the son of man coming from heaven, in the, uh, coming, coming uh, riding in, uh, from the sky in the clouds of heaven. And Caiaphas tore his robe in grief. When God receives news as it were, and I'm using human terms here, when God receives news that his son had died on the cross, he tore his robe in grief, telling Caiaphas the high priest, you tore your robe in grief, denying that this is my son, I'm, touring, I'm tearing my robe in grief, confirming that he is my son, and you just killed him. And that's why when the centurion was standing there and he could have had, he had to have had the curtain of the temple being torn in two because it was as thick as my hand and the tearing, the sudden tearing was so loud, it was almost like a ban. The centurion looks and says, oh my goodness, this was the son of God and we just killed him. Brothers and sisters, may I suggest to you that it is that death and resurrection of Jesus Christ that has the power to heal our society. It has the power to heal our society because reject Christianity all you want. Reject the church all you want, but you are rejecting the only solution to our problems. Think about it. In philosophy, Plato was replaced by Aristotle. In theology, Augustine was replaced by Aquinas. In literature, Shakespeare was replaced by Dickens. In politics, Trump was replaced by Biden. But in life, Jesus Christ is irreplaceable. Amen. And let me give you the ABCs of why I think he is irreplaceable. I don't know how the Swahili translators will do this. I will leave it to them. He is almighty. He is benevolent. He is the creator. He is the deliverer. He is eternal. He is father. He is God. He is holy. He is Emmanuel. He is Jesus. He is king. He is Lord of lords. He is Messiah. He is a no-nonsense necessity. He is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, and omnibenevolent. He is the Prince of Peace. He is quintessential. He is the Redeemer. He is the Savior. He is Trinity. He is unmatched. He is victorious. He is worthy of worship. He is Zenodokio. He is Yahweh. He is the Zenith of Zion. What he redeems? no one can condemn what he condemns no one can redeem the doors he shuts no one can open the doors he opens no one can shut he is the alpha the omega the lily of the valley the bright and morning star the bread of life the king of kings the lord of lords the rock of ages the master of the universe i dare you to hope in him god bless you